Welcome back, folks, to the Golf Unfiltered podcast. As I mentioned at the top of the show, we are joined today uh, by Mr. Robert Price. He is a mental performance coach over at Elite Minds. Robert, thanks so much, and wave to the folks as we're doing this on YouTube as well. Hey, hey, how you guys doing? So, uh, Robert, it's kind of funny. So you and I have a mutual friend, uh, another past guest on the podcast, Corey Holloway. He's over at Wilson Golf, and he introduced us uh, the other day. So uh, how, how do you know Corey? Um, Well, Corey and I know each other uh, actually through his dad. Uh, His father and my father-in-law actually worked uh, together. Uh, And obviously, uh, Corey's dad is a a pretty uh, avid golfer, uh, as my father-in-law was as well. And so uh, he and I have kind of met along those uh, parental ties. So it's pretty cool to to know each other and then that way. And so um, just pretty fortunate enough to to call him a friend, right? So that's good. Nice, nice. Yeah, Corey's a great guy. As I mentioned, he's been on the show before. And, you know, one of the things that he mentioned in the email, uh, the introductory email, was that you work for a place called Elite Minds and you work with a lot of interesting people. So, uh, a mental performance coach, uh, maybe explain to our listeners a little bit about what that means. Sure. Um, one of the things that I, I get to do really is, is working with athletes. Um, around the uh, mental skills acquisition, right? So we all know in every sport uh, that in order to be great at what it is that you do, you need to be able to manage the mental game that that goes on in our own brains. And so uh, for me, what I get to do is actually teach these mental skills uh, so that an athlete uh, can, um, over time, really be uh, mentally tough. But more importantly, I call it being able to perform consistently great in times of stress. And so um, the skills are are really lifelong strategies for success. Mm. Uh, They, they carry over, you know, in people's lives as well. Uh, But, but ultimately these skills are are truly things that can be taught for them, but they're all things that help make someone more mentally tough is a word that people use in golf. We talk about the champion mindset Mm. uh, specifically and what that is and, and so that's one of the pieces that I really uh, hone in on when, when I'm working with someone. So when you mention uh, how people can perform in times of stress, I mean, we, when we think about the games that we see our favorite athletes play, we still remember that they're games, and golf is no different. You know, some might sure. some might argue that it's either a sport or a game, but we're not going to get into that discussion. <laughs> but at any rate. <laughs> um, it is still stressful for these high performers. So that, that's an interesting uh, element of the whole thing. Absolutely. Um, I mean, that that's in, if we care about whatever it is that we do, whether it's public speaking, whether it's work in and of itself, meeting someone for the first time, uh, pitching a product. I mean, all of those things present some level of stress and or anxiety. And so these skills literally do cross all of those things. But for athletes specifically, right, they have a very short amount of time to perform the task at hand. And so uh, by being able to really hone in on these skills, I mean, and this is what separates uh, an elite athlete from another elite athlete. Mm-hmm. Now, the previous episode, listeners, you may remember that we spoke to two gentlemen, co-authors of the new book, The Lost Art of Playing Golf, Mr. Carl Morris and Gary Nickel. And th- we talked a lot about this, actually, Robert, about just the, the uh, lose, as the name implies, losing the fun part of the game. Is that something that you run into with the clients that you work with, at least in the golf side? Uh, yes, I would definitely say so. Um, I mean, there in, in every uh, level, whether it's junior level, whether it's college level, high school uh, professionals, um, you get golf professionals who who have to pass the PAT, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it might take them two years, three years, however long that process is grinding, uh, and so they at some point lose the love of the game, and, and one of the usually the first one or two sessions. Specifically, when I'm working with an individual, we actually dig back into that. I uh, really try to get somebody to tell me the why behind what they do, why are they motivated to do what they do, uh, because that then uh, we can start to build the things that make them happy, but more importantly, allow them to really focus on those particular values because those are the things that are going to get them through those tough times. And that's uh, on that same line of thought. Sometimes it's why people started playing the game in the first place, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> I get to share this, uh, so it's cool. So I have a, a 12-year-old daughter and a, and a 10-year-old son. They both golf. 
Uh, so uh, dad being dad, I had to do something today, but they were out playing. Uh, and, and so I, I get back to them and they're super giddy. Hmm. And uh, I'm like, <laughs> something cool happened. Uh, my daughter had a hole in one today. Oh, really? <laughs> you know, so it's like, but, you know, it was like, it was still for her, like super cool. But then I was like, how come you didn't like come run and find me? She was like, because I still had holes to play. <laughs> you know? like, I still had holes to play. So that speaks to sometimes uh, where golfers are, you know, she's 12. I mean, she takes it serious, but it's still was so exciting for her, but I still had holes to play. Right. So, yeah. That's so cool. Yeah, I, I have yet to get a hole in one. So congratulations to your daughter. She's uh, yeah. she's ahead of a lot of people. But that's right. I mean, we, uh, you know, we talk about, you know, I could give reasons as to why I got into the game. But for the clients that you work with and the people that come and see you, because as you mentioned, you probably see them from all different levels of, of skill level. Um, yes. Is that pretty much one of the first fundamental things you go into is, all right, well, why are you even here in the first place? Yeah, and I, I really, um, I mean, people come for all kinds of reasons. Um, and, and I, you know, I always say the best client comes when they're doing this for, um, I call it preemptive strikes. And so uh, it's a proactive approach versus I'm in this rut or I'm really struggling or I'm in, you know, having the yips. I mean, I get those too. We can work through all of that. Uh, but oftentimes these are, I call them skills that we can build prior to uh, those circumstances even coming along the way. And so, um, but, but yeah, uh, I really try to understand why someone does what it is that they do, uh, specifically golf. I mean, mm. this is not, um, it's a fun sport, <laughs> Yeah. but it's, it's super challenging. Uh, it's simple, but it's not easy. Um, and, and so it, it's kind of neat to, to know that you, you got you to gotta really put in the time uh, to be really, really successful. And that still success is so individually based. And I think that that's, uh, I'm fine. I find great joy in that. Uh, something you just said about being simple, but not easy. I, I love when people joke around and say, well, why don't you play golf? Well, I don't want to go chase a little ball around a field because it, it is simple in concept, but I would imagine when uh, you mentioned that it's preemptive, people come to you because they kind of feel something perhaps uh, brewing in them. Um, what is that feeling that people, what triggers them to come to you preemptively? I mean, that's a lot of self-awareness to be able to do that. Yeah. I think, um, when I get those folks, e essentially what they are, are coming for, if they're not, uh, on the tour, uh, is they they want to, um, feel confident and consistent about their golf game. Uh, and, and they're, they're guys usually looking at, um, I, I would say, club championships or amateur tournaments uh, as, a, as an older player. Um, and, and they really know that this g golf game in and of itself, r realistically, what I always say about it is everyone knows that there is a percentage of this game that is mental. Mm. And what I always find to be unique about what I do is that um, if that is the case, which it is for everyone, uh, and you don't have a professional help train that, then you're leaving that percentage, whatever it might be for you, to chance. Mm. And so whenever you talk to a professional golfer, they pretty much talk about mentally preparation. This is about 90 to 95 percent of what they do. And so knowing that, they spend a lot of time on the mental side of what it is that they're trying to compete in. And um it goes the same for any amateur, if they're 18 handicapper or a 25 or, or two. But the reality that I have found by working in this field specifically is, is that once we actually uh, go through the mental playbook, it's like shots drop very quickly and they then sustain that over time. And so that's just with working on the mind in and of itself. Um, I find even greater results when I'm working with a, a, a golf professional who's working with a student and they're working with me and we're kind of working that thing together. Mm. Um, we see we see really, really good results. And, and I'm really excited about being able to, to continue to offer that and do that and work with other uh, golf PGA professionals. And, and so you just alluded to the fact that you do currently work with people on the PGA Tour, other pro tours, I'd imagine, even if not currently, but certainly in the past. Uh, and obviously we can't disclose who you work with, but I know part of it 
well, let me ask, is part of it players coming to you who may have been successful at one point and then may have gone through a drought and are trying to get back to that? Or, or would you say that there isn't a typical clientele type that you work with? Yeah, I would say that um, it's not a typical clientele um, or a reason why someone comes. Mm-hmm. I think um, what I will probably start to see is a more of a trend, especially in what it is that I do, is that um, one guy will just say, hey, I'm working with you, and they introduce. And it's just – and they want the same thing or they see something – and they want that, and it becomes self referral uh, or, or referral from client to, mm-hmm. to me. And so, um, especially because um, what well, fortunately, you know, I've worked with kids literally from being a junior, college, now they're on Corn Ferry or they're in the tour. And so, you, you have these relationships. And so, along the way, they introduce you to their college mate or their. Uh, you know, guy that they travel in, you know, Brazil and Latin America with, you know, so uh, it just kind of becomes uh, organic in that nature, too. So I think um, depending on the level, but but for the most part, people are, are seeking this out because they know that they really want to be consistently great at what they're doing. Um, and and that, that's really cool. Yeah, it sounds like it. And I know that, you know, working with people, uh, uh, at the professional level, you know, we talk, we, we hear a lot about the, the pro golfers who have their teams with them yes. now. It's not just, uh, you know, I think of like Jordan Spieth saying we all the time with him and his caddy and everybody else. Um, and I know that many of these teams include someone like yourself, you know, a mental uh, professional or a mental performance coach. Uh, is that more of a budding trend on tour in your experience? And if so, how do you feel that is going to evolve over time, if at all? Yeah, I think um, it will become, continue to become more of a trend. I see it a lot. I work with a lot of juniors, uh, high-level junior athletes. And so they, at this very young age, are starting to recognize, or parents are really starting to recognize, that this is an edge, if you will, that they want their kid to have. And so these kids are um, coming into that tournament and that, college and that professional ranks having already had the experiences and so um it's a pretty cool thing and i think that just like in other major sports there is this um team approach to getting the athlete uh primed and ready to go and and so this will be one uh, you know additional add-on uh to what happens i mean uh in my football experiences when I, i work with teams and I've done combine NFL combine readiness programs. And so, I mean, usually when I'm sitting around a table, I'm sitting around a table with uh, a doctor, a sports medicine doctor, an orthopedic surgeon, uh, you know, the, the physical therapist, the nutritionist, uh, speed coach, um, strength and conditioning coach. So there's a, a team approach available. And then there's the mental side to, to what it is that they need to accomplish too. And so, I'm very used to sitting at that table and really being able to be part of that kind of team and getting the most out of players. I mean, uh, it's a, it's a big deal in in all sports, but I think golf is trending that way where it's not as uh, a lonely uh, obsession with just your coach and you and, you know, maybe your caddy. Um, Whenever I work with a professional golfer, I I have to work with their caddy. Mm. Um, and, And some folks have, decided not to work with me because of that but I really know that it is a team and I really want to make sure that the caddy is using the same language that I am using with you so that way we're really growing together and I think that that's you know it's just the best way that's my approach um and it's like a family counseling session you know right everybody's got to be on the same page uh and so I want to make sure that when I'm working with somebody at that level that we're all literally kind of working together so what happens when people aren't on the same page with the team? And, and is it always just focusing back on the player itself, doing what's best for him or her? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the player is the one running the show for the most part. Uh, it's their career. Uh, so however they want to go about managing that and managing the people that are around them, then we, I allow that to, to happen. If I don't feel that it's the best, then I usually, I mean, I've been at it for a little bit. I can, I can easily pull out and, 
say I'm okay. Yeah, fair enough. And you have been doing it for a while. You had mentioned 19 years uh, you've been in the game doing this. Um, let's kind of take it back to some of the things that people come to you uh, for help on. And so you already talked a little bit about some of the more common ones, but you know, during that first session, uh, what are some of the other questions that you're asking players that come for your assistance? Sure. Um, I really want to make sure that they, uh, they want to obtain the, the champion mindset. Uh, you know, that, that they understand that, um, that they can change the most basic characteristics of who they are and what they're thinking uh, so that they can also understand uh, that the things that we think about are, are the things actually that we have the most control over. Uh, and they affect and have super uh, a super impact on on what we feel and what we do. And if that's the case, it's absolutely going to affect our performance. And so, making sure somebody is aware of that, um, I often talk about challenges that they have. Um, I call them goal stoppers hmm. because um, and and those are things. What I always say are things that have gotten in the way in the past of you. Per, of not being able to accomplish a goal that you set. Now, whether that's golf specific or personal or professional and some other thing, those things are always present. So whether that's time management, family sometimes, right? Yep. We have families, I have four kids, a wife, family's huge. And so uh, it, it's a, it, it can be an obstacle that you have to plan for. Uh, and so those are things that we really start, start chomping at the bit at. Usually in that first session, I really just try to get a good understanding and engage I do a, a mental skills assessment with all of my athletes so I can really, I'm a science guy. I really like to, to look at science and numbers and math. And so I do an assessment. I get a good understanding of who they are, what skills they really need to work on because they come de desiring one thing, but then I do an assessment. I'm like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll help you there. But the only way I can get there is kind of really to work on these other pieces. And so uh, for them to have that awareness and, and be able to, to kind of understand uh, the whole process. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting because when we talk about goal setting, especially in golf, sometimes, at least I do, think, well, you know, obviously the pros need to set a lot of goals because they're the ones that have to do this for a living. Uh, but I would maybe talk a little bit about the importance of even just amateur golfers establishing goals and what level or or how difficult those goals should be. You would call them, uh, what was it, uh, uh, what would you call them, goal stoppers? Goal stoppers, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, you think about, um, and, and specifically with amateurs, what I really get them to do, I think, successfully is to understand uh, expectations. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, if, if you're an amateur golfer, uh, one of the things I, I, I mean, and you want to, and you want to play well, um, is we talk about greens and regulation. Hmm. I usually go right there and I say, well, okay, your expectation is to do what? And they usually, oh man, at least, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13 <laughs> regulation. I'm thinking, wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's number 111 on the tour. Oh. You know, or, and they're like, well, well re really? I'm like, yeah, yeah, that guy's like around like, you know, maybe 60%. Hmm. Maybe tour average might be 71% or something like that. Yeah. They're like, really? I'm like, yes. So <laughs> now, we, now we know what we're working with, right? Yep. So now when we're setting a, a realistic goal of greens and regulation, right, maybe now we're looking at eight, nine. That's a that's a really good golf. That's a really good round of golf. Yeah, you have a really good opportunity to shoot and score well if you're getting eight or nine greens in regulation because we're hoping now that we can start working on chipping and putting and you know where are you missing the green? Those other pieces come into play. But I mean that is usually one I always go with because our expectation is like man we're we're and because of television mm -hmm. you know blame blame old Mr. TV um, but the reality is. The, the pro is 67, 68, 70%. And, and then we start walking in like up and downs and two putts. Yeah. Proximity to the hole. Huge with juniors. Uh, <laughs> they want to hit it close or they think they're getting it close or not close enough. And I do the same thing with them. We, we go out on the golf course often with what I do. And we start measuring literally proximity to the hole on your – 
you know, pitching wedge or your sand iron, you know, whatever it is that they're thinking that they should get really close. And I say, well, go compare it to whoever you want. Adam Scott, Tiger Woods, Rory McIlroy, Brooks Kepka. I don't care who you go compare it to. You know, they start realizing like, oh, my, my 28 feet is actually not so bad. And so we start matching those expectations because then that's how we really start to build a super confident uh, a, a player that really is growing in their mindset and now they're going to be able to have that champion mindset because now we recognize oh that was just one of those eight or so greens that i miss in regulation no big deal let me go try to get it up and down versus oh my goodness i can't believe i did that we start stewing over that and our, because our expectation is so high and then we don't have a failure plan like okay well now we just got to go chip it close and close for you might actually be 12 feet right so Let's go make that happen, and then now we can see if we can get a one putt. Or if worse, bogey, we keep it moving. And so I do a lot of that kind of um, expectation management because it, it really helps change the, the focus and the mindset that someone, especially an amateur golfer, comes to me with um, because we watch a lot of television. <laughs> Definitely. Oh, absolutely. And and I know uh, you know we talk a lot about putting as well. You know, people thinking that these guys make ten footers like nobody's business but we're only seeing on television the time that they do make them and so that's right you know that's it's right. important to know I, absolutely i use putting stats all the time as well because again it's it's super important uh and and, and whenever i'm working with you know a, a golfer we, we talk about that especially my my pro golfers there they have high expectations too right so um i always ask them immediately well what do you believe a birdie opportunity is it's super important to know what that is. And then now we start to actually manage around that. Hmm. Uh, and, and some guys are, sometimes it's a surprise. It's like, you know, 22 feet. It's a birdie opportunity. It's pretty long. But if they're hitting it in their really, you know, I always, a lot of times I get to look at their, their books that they, you know, I call them their, their master, mastermind books. <laughs> and so if they're hitting it in the green area that they've highlighted on their you know, green sheet, then that's a makeable birdie. Uh, and so we look at those options and now we can start to build expectations around that too. So uh, when you start getting at that level of golf, we, we start to look at different things a little bit differently, but the reality is still there too. So we're, we're you know, because we know the numbers. Uh, there's three putts. There's a lot of two putts. There's not a lot of 15 footers and in 15 to 10 foot. Those are that's a well-struck putt and they make those and that's a, that's a great birdie. Um, and, and so, uh, for them to also understand those high expectations that they have too, are, are fun. How much does reframing the narrative in someone's mind assist in realistic expectations? Uh, I think that's, um, a lot of the mental game that we work through. Um, because if, if you think about, um, usually I, I look at the champion mindset in, in these categories, if you will, is like you have your worldview, kind of how you, how you see the world, uh, how you then see challenges, huge, right? Mm -hmm. uh, how then do you encounter difficulty and obstacles? They will come. You're playing a sport. There's a lot of misses. Um, how do you understand what effort actually is? How, how do you manage that? Uh, feedback then and criticism, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Important. Uh, and that's why specifically, like I share with you, I need to work with your caddy. They have to be able to provide you the feedback and the criticism uh, that's necessary at that level. Um, and, and sometimes it's maybe your golf coach uh, or, or someone like that. And then how you actually look at success of other people. You, you're starting to hear a lot now with people trying to create rivalries. Right, uh, right. It's, it's unique. But, you know, if you really look at um, an elite athlete, uh, they are excited, actually, when someone else is successful because then that tells them what they need to do to leapfrog them. And, and so there's still pure joy when someone is actually out doing really well. Um, because then they all, they know like, oh, okay, for me to win, I got to bring my, bring my A game. Mm -hmm. and I'd rather win with my A game and their A game going too. And I'd rather beat them then. And, um, and I think that that's, um, 
that's the sign of somebody that has that champion mindset that they're really looking at that. So, you know, those are kind of those major pieces to me to what, how the champion mindset gets set and created and we work towards. But those are some of the major, major concepts. Makes complete sense to me. And listeners, once again, we're speaking with Mr. Robert Price of Elite Minds. Uh, he's a mental performance coach. And Robert, just a few more questions for you. And again, thanks for your time this evening as well. Um, you had mentioned, you know, we're, we're on this conversation or this topic about expectations. And certainly, you know, working with a coach like yourself, establishing those realistic expectations for yourself is one thing. And then perhaps it's for the better amateur player, the elite college player going into the pro tours, they're the expectations that others have of you. Where does that play in that whole dynamic? Um, it's a, it's a unique dynamic. Um, I think what I always share with people is that people are always going to have expectations of you. No worries. Uh, but the reality of it is, is that the player can construct the narrative. The player themselves can tell people uh, what they believe about themselves, and then what happens when you do that is now the audience, the uh, team, you know, those other folks now know what you believe about yourself, and so they start to look and find those things that support the belief that you have for you. If you can do that, uh, and if you have the ability to be unbelievably self-aware to make that happen, um, then the expectations of others become your expectations that you have of yourself, hmm. and they align themselves really nicely. It takes time, uh, but, but if, you're, if you're giving that narrative, well, this is what I'm looking to do, this is who I believe that I am as a player, uh, these are the best skills that I have, you, you, tell them, you basically tell the public and those who are around you what you believe about yourself, then the public and those around you will start to find things to support the belief that you have about who you are. You know, it's all about writing that narrative. I mean, as somebody in the media, we talk about that all the time. You got to write the narrative, you got to make the headline, and people be believe what they want to believe based on what you write. And so it sounds like it's really no different than just establishing that self confidence as well. Absolutely. So, you know, players have the opportunity to do that. Uh, it's up to the media then to, uh, Look for those things and then report on those. But usually that's what happens. Yep. And listeners, be smarter too. But you know, know that these are people trying to make a living and uh, people, good people like Robert are helping them as well to do that and, and to excel at what they do. And, you know, Robert, you had mentioned that a lot of times uh, you know, restructuring this narrative takes time. And something that also takes a lot of time is just getting better at golf. And so uh, <laughs> amateurs like myself and, and yourself and others who are listening to this, who are watching this on YouTube, you know, what are some things who may not have a lot of time to practice busy professionals? Uh, what are some small things that we can work into our own practice routine now, even from a mindset standpoint to get ourselves into what you call the champion mindset? Sure. I think the, the, the big thing is to remind ourselves that when we're because we, we have limited amount of practice time, where do we spend it? <laughs> so I always say on the golf course is the best place to practice. And uh, you can, you know, if you think about a range, uh, especially if you're a northern person, I've uh, been there, I've done that. Uh, trust you to me, I know what the snow looks like, and hitting <laughs> off ice, cold mat. Uh, it, it's a perfect lie, ball in hand, everything is so perfect at the range. That is not golf. I, I don't, you know, very rarely do you get that lie, right? right. So and when you do, you're like, yes, excitement. Um, but on the golf course is literally where I suggest people to spend their time. Um, and, and what that might even look like um, is, yes, you may spend um, realistically, you don't spend that much more money. I mean, buckets of balls and time. If you go play, quote unquote, nine holes, you play a lot of different games. And so um, I'm all about building confidence and, and shots. And so. What really is your 110 yard club? I don't really know, but maybe you should actually go to 110 yards on the golf course for nine holes. Just go play that n number mm -hmm. and hit nine of those approaches. You start to figure out that that might not be the club. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that might not be the one. And you also will start to recognize how many greens and regulation you actually hit with that club from that 
close to the green. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you can start to do some chipping and putting. But that's, I think, um, the best way for an amateur golfer to get really good or improve very quickly with a limited amount of quote unquote practice time. It really doesn't take that long to maybe an hour and a half, uh, maybe two, mm -hmm. uh, kind of play that kind of game around a golf course. Um, and it's absolutely worth the, the effort. Actually, you can just carry those like three clubs out there too and call, call it easy. You can walk, exercise, super fun. Um, so, so th that's, a, that's the best way uh, for on course, if you will, practice. And then working on the mental aspect of what you do is another way to really enhance uh, your golf game when you're lack of practice time. So um, those are some really key aspects to what I share with someone when they don't have as much time as we would like to have out on the golf course. Those are definitely great pieces of advice. And, I, you know, a lot of parts of this country, uh, Robert, including my, myself, uh, we are entering those cold months. And so now's the perfect time to kind of get my mind right to, you know, get ready for the next season. Is that a, a good time? Is my understanding of that appropriate or should I be doing this throughout the year? Um, it, it's it's uh, for someone who spends uh, three, four months waiting to hit a golf ball. Yeah. Um, it's working sad. On the, right, right? <laughs> working on the mental side during the winter months uh, is, is, is awesome because there's still quite a bit of things that we can do. Um, and, and then there's just the, I call it, you can, uh, you can putt all the time. And uh, we got to get putting. We, we got to lock that in. That's for, from every person who golfs, if you can putt, I mean, literally, you can score well. Yeah. Um, and so we can get to a point, even with some drills that we can do, mental drills uh, around that. Uh, that's a whole nother maybe 20, 27-minute podcast <laughs> down, down the road. Uh, but we could really work on a lot of things uh, to really start changing that mindset for you. I mean, there's this beautiful uh, thing called neuroplasticity that we mm -hmm. can actually change how our brain is wired and functioned. And so there's no better time than when you're not necessarily out there, you know, looking for a score. Uh, but, I, but I would tell a golfer if they spent the winter working on their mental game and that when it's when it thaws out a little bit, you're going to be pretty sharp. Um, and, and, and there's some really cool things, especially science stuff with imagery and being able to use that uh, during the winter months is just like practicing. Uh, so we, we, there's a lot of cool things that you can do to kind of make it happen. That sounds great. And I know I've got a lot of homework over this, uh, this, these winter months. So once again, listeners and viewers on YouTube, we're talking to Robert Price. He's a mental performance coach at Elite Minds. Robert, thanks so much for taking time tonight to speak with me. Why don't you let everyone know uh, where they can find you, where they could find Elite Minds, those types of things. Sure, sure. The easiest way uh, is websites. Um, I'm at www.eliteminds.com llc.com um, on Facebook at Elite Minds LLC, Twitter at Elite Minds, Instagram at Elite Minds LLC. Uh, you can find me pretty much anywhere, uh, and I'm really looking forward to uh, folks, you know, asking questions, uh, sending me emails, or or finding me and, and making sure that, that they really want to work on their mental game. That I've developed a mental playbook uh, specifically for them to kind of take them through these skills uh, in a personal way so that they can actually get the maximum benefit for what it is that we're trying to offer. All right, folks, you know where to find Robert now. All over social, he's got it all covered. You can go out to his website as well, reach out to him. Robert, thanks again for taking some time tonight. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, Adam.